Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at this review copy I was sent of Blood in the Chocolate by Kyle Chenier. It's an adventure for Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and it won the Any Award last year for Best Adventure. So it should be pretty interesting to take a look through this. Um, as I said, it's written for Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and you can tell by the front cover that it is an adaption of Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory for old school D&D. Uh, but however, like most OSR games, it can easily be adapted to 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons or any other edition that you prefer. Here's our back copy. Would You Like to Die Deliciously, which is of course a take from the, uh, the movie The Witch. In general, the description is quite hilarious. So let's take a look inside. Uh, first off, I should note as a general content warning that because this is a Lamentations of the Flame Princess book, it has content that may be disturbing for some people, including themes such as cannibalism or even sexual violence. So you need to know your players, you need to know what they like in a game, and you should be able to very easily tone down or remove content that uh, your table doesn't like, right? That's the responsible thing to do. Know what your players uh, enjoy and tailor whatever adventure you're writing so that they'll have a good time. So first off, there's a really great amount of attention paid to the book layout. Uh, the construction of the book is very good. This is not a print on demand book. Uh, like most Lamentations books, you can get it uh, in PDF for very uh, for quite an affordable price. However, the physical books are very high quality. You can either order them from the Lamentations store um, in uh, Northern Europe, or you can get them from your local store. Um, but the construction is really excellent. It's very sturdy. You can see that it is stitch bound. There is stitching holding each of the signatures in. So this makes it uh, very sturdy, very difficult to uh, break or your pages aren't gonna fall out. It's just, it's a book that's gonna last for a really long time. And that's a common theme we see with Lamentations books. Um, there's a great information on the inside cover same thing on the front and on the back. So we have the most important random tables, the poisons and the chocolate effects, um, your basic NPCs and monsters, tracking some of your enemies. And we have a general layout of the factory here, along with short little uh, descriptions of what's in each room. So this is a great little feature that's gonna make the game a lot easier to run. Another nice thing is that each section of the book is color coded by just what the page color is which makes it look like a you know, marbled candy of some kind. That makes each section easier to find. So this book is set in the real world in the, uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, which is when most Lamentations books take place. And, uh, but there's been a twist in that chocolate has been introduced way earlier, uh, or chocolate bars, than it would be historically. Because the main character, or the main villain, Lucia de Castillo, has found a magical chocolate uh, or cocoa tree in South America and has transplanted it into Northern Europe. And from there, she is sending chocolate bars all across Europe, uh, hooking the nobility on her addictively delicious chocolate. And uh, other nobility are sending you, the player characters, to her factory to try and either take it over, steal her secrets, get the information so that her stranglehold on chocolate manufacturing can be disrupted. There's a lot of great advice here for incorporating this adventure, whether you want to do a campaign, a one shot, or anything else. We have some basic back history on how the factory came to be. Getting into running the adventure, there's some great little notes about how to do timekeeping and what the firearms look like, and also just um, what rewards you're going to be given for accomplishing different parts of the adventure. Playing the villain, the main villain is a despicable villain in the very classic style. She's not a tortured or misunderstood person. She's just a really evil, horrible person. So if you enjoy playing that sort of character, then she should be a lot of fun. We have the Pygmies, which are uh, South American um, native Incans, essentially, who have been mutated over hundreds of years by the evil magic of this tree and corrupted into these horrible little monsters that uh, look like cocoa beans now. Their heads look like cocoa beans. And they uh, stay with the tree and worship it and worship the villain who has taken the tree to her factory. So they work as slaves now. They're sort of the equivalent of the Oompa Loompas. Some information on how the chocolate works, including how chocolate is made in general. So it gives you an overview of the chocolate making process, which helps you understand how the factory works. 
And we get to one of my favorite parts of the book, which is delicious diseases and poisons. So when you eat the chocolate, there is a small chance of something horrible happening. But more importantly, we have these different uh, diseases or curses. And these are very frequent throughout the factory. A lot of things are trapped with um, toxic gases and liquids and so on that can mutate the players by giving them these different diseases. And these diseases, by and large, aren't deadly, or they don't have to be if you're careful. But what they do is they uh, debilitate you in different ways. But going even beyond that, they often give you new properties to your player characters that can be used offensively if you're smart about it. For example, you've got a noxious berry curse, which makes you inflate like a giant blueberry, right? It also makes you a lot heavier. So, of course, that makes it hard for you to move and hard for you to attack and anything like that. And if you wait too long, you'll explode in an explosion of blue jelly. But if your friends are careful and they squeeze you occasionally to get all the juice out, then you can actually use this to your advantage, right? Your friends can roll you around like a giant bowling ball smashing through your enemies. Or there's like a taffy skin disease, which makes you all stretchy and rubbery, which has disadvantages, but also advantages, right? I bet you could now squeeze through small areas or reach a lot farther than you could before. Or terrible swells, which makes you inflate and float up to the ceiling, just like in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But of course, this can also allow you to fly if your friends can like anchor you with a rope. So by spreading these diseases all over the factory, your players are going to be constantly mutating and you're going to be getting essentially different tools and ways to interact with the adventure. So no two run throughs are going to be the same because every time your players are going to be different and are going to be able to affect the environment differently. We've got some great color maps here. General factory features, um, including the when the different shipments come in. There is no standard way to get inside the factory, which is carefully guarded, but uh, clever players can find a couple ways in, like possibly sneaking in with the shipments or maybe bribing the guards, possibly climbing up the outside of the factory and going through one of the windows. Lots of different possible options, but it doesn't give you any. It allows the players to get creative. Um, in general, it's really nice how with each of the room descriptions, we have a picture of the room right there with you. So you can sort of picture what's going on. Although in general, I think I would have liked the pictures of the rooms to have a bit more detail. Sometimes the descriptions include things um, like, for example, these coat hooks, uh, which are like uh, gilded golden hands that are hold your, your coats, but they're, they're not on this map. It'd be nice if they were, just to have a little more details on there so that uh, you could pull out more information at a glance. We have the giant chocolate room, including the chocolate waterfall and a boat that you can sail down. We have the Pygmy Village, the old growth cocoa tree, which is generally a very dangerous area because there's giant uh, mosquitoes who will try and plant uh, eggs in your body. We have the sacrificial altars where the, uh, the pygmies are doing horrible things to their sacrificial victims. Of course, this is one of the most gruesome parts of the adventure, which you may want to keep as is or tone down or remove depending on the players that you have. We have the turbine room. We have the roastery and mill. And generally, a bunch of different rooms in the factory where you can see the chocolate making process and how it is uh, sent down conveyor belts and along chutes from one room to another. Uh, things that can possibly be exploited by the player characters to their advantage. Storage and stairwell, chocolate river, a boiler room, an inventing room, where all sorts of new inventions and new um, recipes are being developed. We got a juicing machine. For if you're getting uh, too filled up with juice, you can start deflating yourself. An upper stairwell and Lucia's quarters. So that's basically it. Um, it. There's a great little bit at the end here which talks you through a bunch of different possible endings depending on what the players decide to do. Uh, depending on the tactics they use and the outcome of their mission, lots of different things can um, take effect in terms of the long-term results of their activities. And one especially nice thing is the way that the it breaks down what happens if you take over the factory. If the players decide to go into business making chocolate themselves and just take over manufacture of chocolate across all of Europe, how much money can they make? How is that going to work out? Well, there's actual rules in place here for doing that, since that's probably going to be something that players are going to want to do. Um, one thing that I would probably change a little bit, I'm trying to find the exact page. I'm not sure where it is, but there's a couple places where uh, for example, if you're in the boat going down the chocolate river 
and the players start quoting Willy Wonka from the movie, then they're punished by being tossed out of the boat or the boat bucks them into the chocolate river. Or there's a part where you're trying to open a door that has a musical key. And if players uh, play pure imagination, again, from the movie, then they are punished or the door locks. Or there's a, a negative effect. And I would reverse that. I would, in fact, reward players for knowing as much as possible about the Willy Wonka movie. I think that would be more fun. And it would allow them to guess a lot of things that they should be doing by remembering the movie. I think that would add an element of player skill. And since everyone's going to try it anyway, I think that would be a lot of fun. By and large, it's a really interesting adventure. And it has these lots of these uh, little tricks and little um, things like this tracker, where there's a lot of these pygmies all throughout the, um, throughout the adventure. But having this little tracker here means you can simply cross them off as they die, so you know exactly how many of them, the, how many of them are left and where they are. It just makes things easier to track. There's a lot of care that's been put into making this easy to run and making the adventure highly variable. For example, the villain actually has a schedule, like which rooms that she's going to visit in which order. So it means you know where she's going to be at all times. Uh, the different monsters in the different rooms are going to have different attitudes and different ways that they behave when the players interact with them. And the way that the players are all going to be mutated by the different diseases is going to give them a ton of variety and options in terms of how they deal with their environment. That's really my sort of adventure. I really enjoy when games give you th that level of uh, options for the player characters and encourage creativity instead of setting up, here's how you do things, let's hope the players figure that out. I don't enjoy that sort of adventure, and this book really does not encourage that, which is great. So uh, that's Blood and the Chocolate. Um, if you would like to check it out yourself, I will put a link in the description below, as always. And stay tuned for next Wednesday when I will be reviewing kidnap the arch priest which is a really fascinating little adventure that just got released recently it's written by skirples who writes the coins and scrolls blog and it's an adventure it's not too long that looks through how you can run a heist adventure that allows players to plan and connive and find a way to kidnap this guy who's essentially the pope um, without getting caught and it gives the dm the tools to make that really easy while allowing for a lot of player planning which is really cool and doesn't require a whole lot of prep. So I'm very excited to read through this and show you guys next Wednesday. Um, a special thanks to Jack, uh, Jack Bremer, who recently became a patron at uh, the Questing Night level. Thank you, Jack. You are awesome. You're keeping the channel running, and I couldn't do this sort of thing without you. Um, that's it for this uh, review today. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to subscribe if you want to check out all the rest of my reviews and keep up when my new reviews are coming out. Thanks. I'll see you guys all later.